Greetings and salutations, everyone. It's time for another episode of Viewport Relay, a bi-weekly podcast where the Viewport team looks at the latest news in the gaming industry. As always, I'm your host, Albert Corson, joined by Tristan Jung. Gobble, gobble. And Alex Nestor. Hey. Gobble, gobble. It's turkey season for Americanos. And what, hey. do, what do they do? Canada, do they do anything, Tristan? It's a, it's a typical Thursday. It's a, just, so, a, just a Thursday. So people will head out to work as they should. As and they should? <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Well, I mean, if you have a job, you, sh- you should, but you know. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. We will partake in in some of the Black Friday festivities if via the, if the internet. Via, via the, the internet. internet. Yep, which have been happening for about the past two weeks now. So mm-hmm. I mean Black Thursday start, or Black Friday starts on Thursday at this point. <laughs> great great mm-hmm. Thursday, Black Friday. Yeah, exactly. You know. But yeah. We have a segment now on this podcast. Oh no. Starting now that I just came up with it on the spot. That's called oh, Okay. What have you been playing that's not Final Fantasy XIV? <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, no. I mean, I can go first, but I Tristan feel like go I, first. I might perhaps be the only person that has an answer to this. Hey, I have technically played another video game. Oh, okay. All right. I, I, will, the, I will go first, though. I have been playing some Pokemon Sword, which has been an eye-opening experience. And somewhat of a disappointment. I It took about 24 to 28 hours to go through the whole thing. Now I'm kind of in the competitive aspect. Um, you know, Ditto and I are making babies, if you know what I mean. Oh, oh, yep. Yeah. Getting those IVs up. Yep. How, how was your first Gigantamax experience? Uh, that's a personal question, so I will not be answering that. Oh. <laughs> um, to be honest... Dynamaxing is first sounds like a stereo a steroid um, alternative, but in in technical terms, it's just a rename of Z moves and Soul Stones or or what they had before. So it doesn't change it up too much. I think the only interesting part is that you can only do it in certain situations. You can't do it all the time. Um, but honestly, nothing too revolutionary. I think that Don't sums up the whole game, to be honest. I'll ask, and it's a five-second review. What What about the online raids or whatever they're being talked about? I see it everywhere. It's an interesting concept. First, I think the online system's kind of broken in the sense that it's really hard to find public raids. So if you don't have mm. friends to play with... It's Just like impossible to find... No, I, I have a group that I've been playing with with like six or seven people, so it's okay. But... You know, finding public raids is really hard, and the raids are, uh, the difficulties are tuned to be, to play with four real people. So, if you're playing with, uh, uh, they fill it in with NPCs if you can't find anyone, and, you know, if you're gonna do that for a five out of five star raid, good luck. Yeah, considering, uh, the typical Pokemon AI, yeah, I'd expect that. Yeah, and they don't do type matching either, so they usually just put, like, a magic carp against a, you know, Whatever five star raid is. Oh boy, yeah. mm-hmm. a fair thorn. Yeah. Hey, I mean, if you want to participate in raid night, you got to have the raid number of people, right? <laughs> but I'm I'm getting very close to that review. I'm just I just need to write it out. So basically, I haven't done anything, I guess, and, <laughs> and compile all the media. I'm very close to that review. I just need to write the review. No, 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 I have an idea on how to format it and what the I main be- main I points will be. I it'll believe be, you. It'll come after Thanksgiving. I don't want to ruin anyone's Thanksgiving dinners, um, you know, exactly. over this. Exactly. Alex, do you, if you have nothing to say, you wear the cone of shame. I, I'm just going to don the cone right now. All right. What, what about a new experience in Final Fantasy XIV? You know what? I will account that for nothing because that's Final Fantasy. <sighs> but you can talk about it. Tell your story. All right, so I'm taking advantage of the uh, newest update, uh, gathering changes. I leveled Fisher up all the way to 80 in like a week or so. Really was no effort at all. Thanks, Yoshi uh, P. Yeah, thank you, Yoshi. Uh, it's oddly enthralling. It's a very different type of play. And I'm actually pretty excited that's way different from uh, Botanist or Miner. There's a lot of thought involved, which was surprising to me. There's there's a way to manipulate the RNG is all I'm going to say. 
on a scale of one to ten, how many big mass, big mouth bass, Billy or whatever they're called, the the singing fish, how many of those do you want to buy now? Mm, <laughs> at least three point seven five of them. Okay, that's that's acceptable. I do have a request. Yes, I think we need more aquariums in our in our house. Yeah, I was thinking about that. If can you we get can that build... through fishing? No, we can make them though. We can get the fishes, right? Yes, yeah. the rare fish, we need to catch them, and then, you know, that takes all kinds of things. The weather condition to be right, the time to be right. So Tristan's essentially just playing the Wild of Area Pokemon 2, but in Final Fantasy fourteen, right? Very much so, but even more restrictive in conditions. Ah. Like, the legendary catches in Final Fantasy fourteen are just absurd for some of them, in terms of what they require you to do. Well, luckily you have Master Fisher, Tristan Jung, right here. Yeah, mm-hmm. he, he's my senpai in this ordeal. Cool, cool. All yeah. right, I don't want to don the cone, so I'm copping out here a little bit. Because I play it every week, at least a couple hours. I'm playing Smash Bros. Playing, uh... playing, playing Terry, Terry Bogard. You know, Power Geyser and Bust a Wolf and stuff like that. Would you, you know? say he's okay? He's pretty good. Uh, I'm not like his combos are really hard to do, uh, like really fast on the fly, reactionary mm. things like that. But um, super fun to play. Probably, probably the second most fun character behind Joker, or maybe even above Joker. Joker's just OP, so maybe that's why he's fun. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I got challenged Strength. to Smash Duel at work today, so I may I may hit you up for some tips. Don't play Terry; <laughs> he's hard okay, to play. Understood. Display Wolf. That's what I tell everyone. Um, other than that, I just realized Game Awards coming soon and going to get a new character announcement, so get ready for that one. It's going to be uh, Hideo Kojima. It's going to be mm-hmm. Norman Reedus. <laughs> it's going to be Reedus. Sam Porter Bridges. The baby. Just the baby. The, yeah. the, the baby. The fun- funky fetus. <laughs> yep, I saw that meme. Norman Reedus and the funky fetus. Yep. Alrighty. It's time to get into some some news, huh? Woo! Yeah, let's let's do some news. There there was big news. There was the biggest news. All right. Yeah, pr- so the long meme. long long ago, in this same galaxy that's not that far away, there was a series. It was called Half Life. It was it was marvelous. Everyone, it was glorious. You should have should have seen Gabe Newell at his prime. <laughs> He was he was enormous. It was Can enormous. Can we request a 2009 versus 2019 for Gabe Newell? He turned mm-hmm. into Santa Claus. Essentially, was what happened. He just grew a beard. Mm-hmm. But in the great drought of 2000, and oh boy, I didn't look it up beforehand. I want to say 2007 is when the orange box came out. Um, but that's the last time we got to see Mr. Gordon Freeman and the G-Man and that. That lovely crew, except for the ending, we got we got a cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. But twelve, I guess thirteen, because it's coming out next year. Thirteen years later, it's here, everyone. A new Half Life game, Half Life the pre sequel. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's true. Yeah. It's yeah, here. It it's VR. You guys see that trailer? What'd you think? I actually think it looks really interesting in terms of how the gun handling is going to be performed it's of course a vr only game they're marketing as such and you will have to have vr to play it uh but you know you like manually reload the guns and stuff it actually looks really cool as a half-life game i i had this like weird fascination that was the non-sexual way to put it with gun reloads. Excuse me. <laughs> I was going to say fetish, but I didn't want to say that. So anyway, I have this weird fascination with gun reloads and the fact that the the part where like Alex finds a shotgun shell oh. in the, oh, in the bookshelf for the cupboard and she puts it in. That was amazing. I am so excited for this game. I My only concern was that I thought it was going to be a really short you know, like two hour, three hour, but I, I believe they have mentioned that this is a twenty plus hour video game. I heard it was fifteen to twenty hours, according to Keely. This this is this is lit like we hear of VR games, we're like, oh, this is gonna be a cool five to six hour thing, right? Mm-hmm. Val's mm-hmm. like, no, here's an actual full 
20 hour up to single player experience game. I mean, TBH, Todd Howard has done this before, right? Skyrim I mean, okay, VR. Okay, let's yes. fall out let's VR. Out. Oh, Doom no. VR. Oh, no. Wait, Todd, Todd to do? I, well, I, yeah, of course. He, he should not get that credit. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Alex already brought it up, but VR only. Good? Bad? What are they, what are they trading off here? Well, yeah, there's a smaller market, obviously. A lot of people haven't bought into the idea of VR yet, uh, still. Uh, yeah, that's really only the crux of it to me, so... Tristan, any thoughts? As a fan, what do you think, Alex? Or maybe I, not a fan, but as someone who thinks this game looks interesting. It's still a hard sell to me to go out and buy a VR headset device just for this game only. So really, I'm not too interested in those short experiences that you just kind of mentioned. Because cool, they're like cool tech concepts, but then they don't really evolve in my eyes into a full-fledged game. I think for longtime fans, they'll shell it out. I, I saw some mm-hmm. comments saying, you know, when Half-Life 2 came out, I bought a new PC. And now that Half-Life Alex is coming out, I will have to buy a new house. Oh, right? I thought they're going to say, I need to buy a new PC and a new <laughs> VR. Because, like, they need the space to play it. I think all the shortcomings of VR that we mentioned over this podcast is, are still there. I'm also worried about, like... I have a quest. I know they came out with the Oculus Link so you can play PC games on it, but do I need to buy separate hardware to play this? And if so, do I really want to spend 600 extra dollars to play a 20 hour, 15 to 20 hour game? I'm yeah, like, is this going to be like fence. optimized for the Valve Index or something? What, what's going to be the requirement? I, I don't think it will be the selling point for many people. I think it'd be like, basically it'll overtake super hot or whatever kind of the number one mm-hmm. vr game right now beat saber but it, it won't be a hardware seller so is this game gonna be like the greatest vr game that no one ever played uh well maybe not like maybe 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 the greatest game no one ever played i don't want to say vr because obviously if you have vr you're probably 100 percent gonna buy this game if you're at all remotely interested in the series I think even if it's really, really cool and, you know, game changing, blah, 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 the, the barrier, the barrier to entry is still way too high. Like you, you need to drop so much money to, mm-hmm. to play this video game. So it, like this game is, it doesn't have a chance at being, I don't know, the, the Wii sports of VR, right? So everyone's like, eh, motion controls look kind of meh. And then Wii Sports came out and everyone got a Wii. But that's because the Wii was cheap, right? Mm-hmm. But this is like, looks cool, but still too expensive. Yeah, exactly. Is there some concerns regarding, hey, I saw this guy play it. It looks cool. Still too expensive. But a lot of people are saying, like, Keely especially, like, no. Like, a YouTube video does not convey the experience you get while playing this game. Like, shell out the money it's worth it sort of deal does that does that at all like resonate with non-vr players or is it just eh people like this is going to have a hundred percent attach rate for people at vr maybe sell a couple systems like you said but commercially like to spend five years making this game it might financially not have been worth it essentially i'm asking to, to sum up the like was this this was this a a what do you want to call it like a and i mean it's 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 kind of obvious right but like cr- this was sort of a dis- was this a decision by valve as a financial move or more of a studio we want to build something cool move which you know probably the only studio in the world that gets to do that i think it was a bit of a they want to make something cool and they also wanted to finally appease half-life fans who've been waiting like a decade for the next installment of anything. Uh, but on that note, I don't know. I think Half-Life Alex specifically will be a hard sell to a new audience. Because mm-hmm. it's kind of throwing them just kind of in the middle of a story. Uh, mm-hmm. And on that note, uh, things like what Keeley said or things like that, where you're kind of experiencing something you've never felt before, 
I mean, that's really just a typical tagline to hear of basically any game ever that they play. That's uh, right. So the first, the <laughs> oh, first coming from type game. I I wasn't gonna mention names, but there are games released recently that uh, have had such things said about them. Uh, I mean, that one was true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For better or worse, but For yeah, that, worse. that's just kind of my thoughts on it. Coming into that question, Tristan, anything? Yeah i I think it will satisfy a small portion of people, but it's it's not going to be industry changing. I'm, I yeah, may really my you words, don't think but that, you don't think this is going to push the bar. It will that push is- the bar, but it's not going to. F- it, it, it's not going to be the thing that makes like. Um, you know, ten percent adoption rate to fifty percent adoption rate uh, adoption rate for VR yeah. hardware. Yeah, because I feel this is still very much FPS focused game, or at least what we've seen so far. So, if you're not into FPS, I don't think this is gonna really push your buns at all. It, I, it's, don't, I don't think the Half Life story, as good as it is, it's not gonna like appease people who are really in it for story. I don't think. Yeah, it's it's hard to say, right? Because it's. You buy a new, like, let's say PS5 costs $700, right? Ooh, that's pretty expensive, right? But you know for the next 6 to 10 years that this is going to have many successful and great games on it versus you mm-hmm. buy an Index. This might be the one amazing game that only comes out in the whole history of the Index until maybe Valve makes another game, but you can't wait for that, right? You'll be you'll be yeah. dead when that happens. You'll be, yeah, you'll you'll, be you'll basically be at retirement age by yeah. the time that happens. And then you'll have enough money to buy one finally. Um any thoughts on sort of what this means to Half Life as a franchise? Is it you think it's gonna go further than this? Do you think we're gonna have to wait as long or Valve time is Valve time and whatever? <sighs> this point I'd say I'm hopeful that the next major Half Life installment is kinda coming based on this. I think this is probably going to like ease people back into the story and then also kind of maybe go a bit further than what we saw in the story. But, yeah, I'm just kind of hopeful at this point that they do something with it. It'll actually be a card game. Half-Life oh. 2. Hard effect. <laughs> Hard effect. Uh, last question, and this is sort of an anecdote based on sort of what we've said recently. And it's, I feel like this game was... Like, the Valve Index and, like, its features were almost, was made to showcase this game, rather than the game being made to showcase, like, to showcase and sell the Index. Hmm. Like, hmm. they they were thinking of this game, and they made the hardware based on it? Exactly. What you're okay. And part of it is, like, like people are like, oh, wow, they're making this game to just sell Indexes. And it's like, mm-hmm. well, if that was the case, then why are they releasing on five different VR headsets, right? Mm-hmm. If they wanted to sell indexes, it would be index exclusive. So, and I feel like some of the crazy features that this game has, like, only takes advantage of some of the index stuff. I'm just interested to see how it'll actually run on non index headsets. Yeah, like the hand stuff. Does the quest have, like, hand tracker stuff? The like, quest finger tracking? Has finger tracking. Two, two triggers. Actually, all Oculus stuff has two triggers. Yeah, the two trigger. Because this thing had, like, finger tracking, I think, in the trailer. Yeah, well, I mean, like, super hot how they do it is, like, the, the top trigger is for your index finger, and then the bottom trigger is for all your other fingers. So oh. I'm sure they'll figure it out. So you have an mm-hmm. opposable thumb. You have two giant thumbs. One's four, four fingers connected together as a thumb. Mm-hmm. I see. Okay. All right. I mean, it's a very, I think this is the most interesting development in the VR field right now. So I'm I'm pretty excited about it, but, oh Mm -hmm. God, every time I say I'm pretty excited about it, I just have PTSD. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Definitely is a harbinger of bad things to come. So this is going to fail, two out of ten. This is like uh, (laughs) the the 3DO game console back in the day that cost like $600 back then. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Which would be like a thousand dollars nowadays, and I had a really good game on it called Gex, and I played it at my cousin's house, but no one knows of it because no one owned that console. So yeah, 
Also, I just want to bring up that um, I'm not even if I had an index, I wouldn't buy this game because I don't want head crabs jumping at me in VR because I would literally poop my pants. Oh man, they're actually gonna eat your head. Yeah. Can you imagine like I- I'm sure horror games already you know have this problem, but just like yelling, recoiling back, and bashing your head into a wall. <laughs> well, like I've sure punched it's my wall so many times while playing the uh, super hot. <laughs> yeah, You're I'm at- too close. Imagine the uh, waivers inside the EULA that we all accept. Alrighty. Any more Half-Life thoughts? I can't believe they, like, somehow found a way not to finish Half-Life 2 Chapter 3. Yeah. I mean, in their Yet interview, though, game. this kind of made sense, because in their thing with Keeley, they said that the expectations for Half-Life 3 were just so high, they couldn't make it, like the same sort of experience they had to change it up Mm -hmm. so this is like their their little i mean it's gonna be it looks amazing but like you know a new their their compromise exactly i don't know yeah yeah and maybe and they also i mean obviously they still thought like vr was the best way to go for this game and i'm sure it's gonna be cool but obviously not a win-win in terms of what valve wants versus what the fans want Alrighty, we're gonna move on I don't, I don't know how much we have talked about it. We're going to talk about Pokemon. Um, Yay. It's had some troubles. It's had... Are you sure? You know, <laughs> it's I mean, booming. Business is booming. Yeah, I mean, it. let's put it that way. It's had some co- content struggles. I don't know what to say about it. But financially, business is a booming. Mm-hmm. Highest selling Switch game ever. Ever. Yep. Or it like fastest selling, not highest. Yes. Fastest selling, selling Switch game. In its opening weekend. Six yeah. million. And this article said opening week. I think it was opening four days, actually, is what oh, the stat geez. actually was. Yeah, it's only been out since, what, Friday? No, two, two Fridays ago. Two Fridays ago. But oh, it's this actually art- been that long. This tweet long. Okay. was a little bit ago. But, uh, yeah, so this game is selling like hotcakes. And as with most Pokemon games, there is a lot of controversy regarding features um Mm -hmm. so we go back to the age-old question of does pokemon need change not the change that it's been getting for the past few gens which i think i've gone over this but you know game freak has this habit of just introducing gimmicks like uh mega evos uh z moves and now dynamaxing and they just disappear at some point they just keep making a new gimmick over and over again The, the same new gimmick Yep, and it just drives me crazy. It's just like some way of your Pokemon gets stronger <laughs> in a fight. Yeah, basically once. it's to make your uh, your favoriteest Pokemon become stronger temporarily. Pretty much. But th- this one, I think, is the most divisive in terms of what they did. Because this is like the first instance where they just removed a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tristan's got a bit more experience on it since he's been the main man to play it so far of the group. My opinion is exactly the same as Alex's. Like the, the biggest change that's been causing the fan base to go into uproar is no national decks and removal of moves, which has never happened before. And I yeah. think, you know, they, they made a weird statement around it. They said, you know, it was going to take too long, blah, blah, blah. But I think it also puts kind of the future of the, the franchise at risk. Because that was kind of the main selling point, right? Whatever Pokemon you had from Red and Blue, you can somehow find a way to bring it all the way to Sword and... Uh, what was the last one? Ultra Moon and Ultra Sun. Mm-hmm. But now that's starting to change. The Pokemon that you've trained now start to, you know, forget their moves because they don't even exist in this game. So I think they need to make a decision on what they want this franchise to be. Should it be more of kind of the standalone entries that you you play on like a call of duty right call of duty doesn't have progression uh you know cross saves and or should they go back to their original formula of let's support nine thousand pokemon each with uh unique animations and and balancing stats and all that fun stuff Mm -hmm. it kind of reminds me of uh what digimon does where you know they just have to cut it at some point because Digimon's even worse. They have like thousands of Digimon at this point. And I just have to put in the kind of set of them in each game. Do you, mm-hmm. do you think that this game sort of took the blunt of it because it was the first one? Like eventually it had to happen, right? 
And, you I know, am. yes, th- mm-hmm. three games down the series, once they cut Pokemon, are people going to be up and roar about it? Up in arms about it? I, I think the the way they addressed the controversy was what made people really, really angry. Mm-hmm. I agree with you that it would have had to happen at some point. But, like, I think they, the fans just feel lied to, which is the biggest issue. Interesting. Here's the thing, though. With these sales numbers, like... What does that tell Game Freak, right? Like, hey, you need to listen to your fans more. Or it's, hey, you cut all this stuff out and this game still sold the most, the fastest selling Switch game of all time. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And does that show, like, that Nintendo needs to listen to their hardcore fan base? Or it's, hey, this is a game that appeals to everyone. Obviously, vocal minority, like, and even, like, uh like news websites and things like that, you know, a lot of bad press, but why stop doing what you're doing when it's selling well, right? Yeah, and I feel that's really the crux of it is, yeah, their Pokemon as a franchise is just, at this point, probably too big to fail at anything. They can basically make the worst game possible, and I think it'll still sell extremely well, and it won't really hurt their sales on the next game. I think even critically, this game didn't do horribly, right? It did, yeah. like, I would say above average, right? Like, I would say if a 7 out of 10 is an average score, it did well above that. I I honestly, I, you'll see this in my review, but I honestly think they added a lot of cool quality of life things and fixes to make things easier. That What about, have... what about the sound? <laughs> Having to unlock the sound thing. Like, even that wasn't that big of an issue. I think whoever wrote that article just, like, blew it up out of proportion. My my biggest complaint is all these new features feel a little half-baked. Like, they went 40% of the way in with each of them, although they're really cool things. And I, at no point, have I thought, oh, man, I wish they added all 900 Pokemon here. I don't think that kind of was any part of my experience. Hmm. Yeah. I will say, as someone who plays Pokemon on the more casual side, it's like, I don't even remember half the Pokemon for most of the gens that, like, you know, cut out a couple things here and there. Mm -hmm. Pretty much only the most diehard of fans notice. I mean, obviously, it's like, okay, if you had a favorite Pokemon from, like, Gen 3 and they cut it out, you're going to feel kind of bummed. But, eh. What do you think? Do you think that the fans set themselves up for a little bit? I mean, obviously, Nintendo wasn't exactly truthful when it came to the marketing and, you know, cut features. Uh, I will hold them accountable on that one, but do you think that fans sort of pushed the bar up saying, oh, this is a home console game. Oh, it's it's got to push the bar more than a handheld game. I think that was the expectation going into it. People were thinking, oh, finally a uh, full console Pokemon game is coming out. This is going to be amazing in terms of all the content it's going to have. And ultimately they ended up announcing, hey, we can't actually do all these Pokemon because we don't have the resources or whatever excuse they gave. That was kind of weak when they actually delivered it. So, yeah, it really kind of deflated the whole situation when they... But, I mean, announced. Nintendo never said that, right? They never said, like, hey, this is going to be... This was the fans just sort of like, oh, home console means more stuff. Be True. But I guess there's that expectation that since it's no longer limited by a handheld system... It's going to be a very substantial entry. That's true. I think the number one thing I was disappointed was how, like, mediocre it runs. Oh, my God. Oh, but yeah. Potentially even how poor it runs for a home console port. I mean, the Switch I- isn't a powerful system, but Nintendo games in general run pretty solidly on the Switch. Mm-hmm. I think that's been a telling weakness of Game Freak for the past few generations of Pokemon games at this point. Uh even going back to X and Y, and then onward from that. The performance has just gone steadily worse on 3DS. Up sun to and, sun, sun and Moon, moon man. and Holy Ultra Sun moly. and Moon. Oh my god, it could barely render battles on a normal 3DS. You mean, if you consider it that way, Alex, it has, the performance has gone up dramatically. Because Sun it and did, Moon was switch, abysmal. Yeah. You would mm-hmm. run a Z-move and it would go like 6 <laughs> FPS. Yeah, that that is true, but even 
the, then when it's on a Switch console and it's still struggling to run Pokemon at a steady frame rate, there, there's just issues there. They're going to be like guys that used to run at 6 FPS and now it runs at 18. All right, we tripled mm-hmm. the frame rate of Pokemon. Your eyes can only see 24 anyways. Meanwhile, like Super Mario Odyssey is like one of the great, like best looking games on the Switch and it runs at 60 FPS. Mm-hmm. Even, I think Alex brought up Astral Chains. Even yep. Astral Chains mm-hmm. runs smoothly on the Switch. Yeah. Yeah, that's always the Platinum Games objective is to make their games run as smoothly as possible. And it shows. They they pull off a lot of graphical feats while somehow maintaining performance. While Pokemon somehow can't with low-risk textures and stuff. But Toby Fox, Alex. That's true. He has songs in here. That's that's why the frame, frame rate dips. The, yep. the quality of the music cannot yep. be maintained by the hardware <laughs> Alrighty. any other pokemon thoughts any message to nintendo should they listen I'm, to their fans more? uh i'm curious Did, why they remove so many moves it, it's confusing to me it's too hard right. to animate them alex it, uh, honestly, yeah, i guess so honestly the animation is like completely hit or miss it's mm-hmm. either super customized to the Pokemon, like Sir Fetched has some really fancy animations for his moves, or they mm-hmm. go back to the usual, like the Pokemon does a little hop and, and then yeah, it kind of hits them. Yeah, so I'm not Classic. really sure what their priorities were. Yeah, I don't know if it, like, if the Pokemon team needs to get bigger, but it's, it sounds like they don't have enough resources for all the yeah, money they're making. It's a small indie company. I know, yeah. right? Alrighty. Um, uh, we're going to talk about more interesting news in terms of selling well, but I don't know, like critically or even like to the public base mm-hmm. there. New yeah. IP, which is, yeah. uh, always Anyways, interesting to let see. Let me get into the thing. Uh, Death Stranding becomes biggest IP launch of this generation in Japan. So is it, you know, controversy is good? Question mark. Uh, <laughs> Well, that's a broad question. Well, I, I mean, this game was so controversial, you didn't think, right? It, you didn't think it would, like, be the number one. Like, this thing outsold, like, uh, Sekiro and, like, all God Bloodborne. of War, Bloodborne. Well, well, I don't know if that was an IP launch. I guess it kind of was, but. Relaunch, I guess, but. <laughs> yeah. I, but, yeah, like, usually, I, like, a controversial game maybe at the start will, right, like, sell, like, a little, and then, you know, as people kind of figure out if it's good or not, they'll kind of buy more into it. But this one, like, off the bat, just... Is this, like, a Kojima effect? Is that what's going on here? What's going on here? Yeah, th- there was so much hype built up by everything. With the whole... It was basically a, a pro wrestling storyline where, you know, Kojima had his whole falling out with uh, Konami. Uh, then suddenly he's sitting with Andrew House of Sony, and they're announcing that he's been picked up kojima productions for a new total ip experience and it's going to be like nothing you've ever seen some new gaming experience and i mean it just built up from there of course we had the trailer with uh del toro and mads and stuff it, it just exploded at that point do you think there's been a lack of new ip especially like recently a little bit yeah uh there's been some out there, like uh, Days Gone ended up selling really well, despite having very mediocre reviews. Uh, that's kind of the main one I can think of Sony releasing this console generation. But it is a general consensus that we're seeing a lot of either sequels to old games, or we're just seeing old games re-re- re-released as remasters. Yeah, because you would think as a... I mean, obviously, it's like it—it it is like skewed a little towards that end. But obviously, as a as a console's age grow and the install base gets bigger, right? Mm-hmm. It's more likely that more later launch games in the console's life cycle will sell better. Um, mm-hmm. So, like looking at that list, we had Death Stranding number one at one hundred and eighty-five thousand, and then it drops quite significantly. The next three are all kind of close right. together, but we got Judgment from Sega, which was a two thousand eighteen. Sekiro at 150,000. Uh, that was obviously this year. And then last year, or many, many, many years ago, Bloodborne at 150 as well. So, uh, Death Stranding was like, I don't know, math is hard, but like, mm, like 15 to 18% higher, somewhere around there, right? I so, think, uh, 
to answer your question, this is all Kojima's brand name, right? Mm -hmm. And the excitement and the marketing and whatever happened, the wrestling story. It's interesting to note that in the replies of the tweet that we're looking at, uh, the person says, but hey, if you want to somehow spin this negatively, Death Stranding was the worst launch for a Hideo Kojima game in Japan since Zone <laughs> oh, really? of the Enders. Yeah. So, 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 I mean, looking at his track record, maybe not as great. Maybe it goes back to your question of, like, this generation just hasn't been too great with new IP. Yeah, I could, I could see that. Um, but man, what a seller. I don't yeah, know it's what definitely impressive for Japan, of all countries. They kind of tend to go downwards with IP sales. Isn't it more expected out of Japan? Well, I think this is physical sales, is what yeah, I'm I guessing. I see. Which, physical retail has just been declining rapidly in Japan for the past decade or so. Hmm. I, I know there's not a lot of sites out there, but I would like to filter and see what the critical like reception is to Death Stranding. I forgot mm-hmm. what Famitsu game it, gave it. Oh, uh, 30, 40, 39. Oh, 39. <laughs> oh, God, okay. Of, of course. I th- no, it's they only- gave it a 40 out of 40, that's right. But they gave yeah. like all their Kojima games 40, 40 out yeah, of 40. Yeah, exactly. Kojima, well, has, added to the Kojima list. has like three or four games that are all 40 out of 40s by F- Famitsu at this all point. Right, so we can't listen to Famitsu is what mm-hmm. you're telling me. Okay. Well, not, not for Kojima games. No. Not for Kojima games. Huh. So maybe sort of like, obviously said it's the worst Kojima game, uh, in Japan. I mean, worst like the selling launch. at launch. Worst selling for physical. at launch. Um, it's like a, it's like a very weird slice that we're looking at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. But just maybe like the critical reception that it got in Japan wasn't as like prominent, right? Like with mixed reviews. I haven't seen the US sales numbers though, so it would be interesting to compare sort of like, Big launch here versus big launch. Obviously, it wasn't biggest new IP launch of mm-hmm. the United States, so. Or, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I know I read an article in uh, the UK. It was the second best selling PS4 game behind Days Gone. Interesting. I didn't know Days Gone sold that well, first of all. Yeah, that, that surprised me as well when I saw that number because I knew what the reality of that game was after it came out. Yeah. Oh, you bought that game. I forgot about that. Oh, you bought Days I, Gone? I did not buy Days Gone. Oh, I thought, oh you watched someone play through Days I wa- Gone. I watched Eris play Days Gone. Just like Gone. you watched people play Death Stranding. Yeah. Alex like, that's the only way to experience Death Stranding. I live vicariously through games while playing Final Fantasy XIV. That's just how I roll nowadays. I, I'm more interested to see where Kojima goes next. And well, obviously, mm-hmm. he's going to make movies, judging by our movie. conversations last episode. But, like, how the public will be receptive to that. Like, let's say he mm-hmm. announces Death Stranding 2. Will people be excited? Will people not be excited? What's the cast list? Is If he makes Death Stranding 2, it'll be the third game of the Strand genre of Strand games. Well, what's the second game? Death Stranding. Wait, what's the first game? Oh, it's the first Mario. game. Mario. Oh. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Mm-hmm. I forgot already. <laughs> Miyamoto at it again. Miyamoto I, at it again. Yeah, I think I sent it earlier today. There was actually an article where he was saying that he wants to make the scariest horror game ever. You know, I so think he could that pull that one off, actually. Honestly, I feel that's just another part of the wrestling storyline. He's bringing up the old uh, knowledge, which was, of course, PT slash Silent Hills. He wants so to make that game. Which one of these games is The Undertaker? Uh, Undertaker, let's see, I'm trying to remember how the meme goes, he he would be the, he'd be Death Stranding, and I guess <laughs> Silent Hills would be Mankind, and uh, yeah, so Death Stranding jumps off the hell in the cell and lands on Ma- uh, Silent Hills. I'll take it, let's move on. Uh, We're going to finish today talking about something Tristan loves, oh, God. dear and true to his heart. It's called Google Stadia. Uh, So the main story that we're going to do, and it's going to lead into sort of just a general discussion, but uh, users reporting that their Chromecast Ultras are overheating while playing Stadia games. Let's just talk Stadia for a bit. Um, How the launch went, what are some issues, any successes? You know, Justin, you want to... That was me dropping my, my Stadia paperweight on my desk. 
Oh, pa- oh. oh. This box Turn, uh, contains... The, the, the floor is yours. This box contains disappointment. You open it up and the controller's there that I have yet to turn on. Then you, you, you go to the next layer and there is a Chromecast Ultra that I forgot that they package. And a bunch of wires that I have not used. Um, I think... So I put this article in our list to discuss, but I think this is the least of my concerns about this thing. The Stadia, I think, just has been a very big disappointment. I'm not sure why they built this and who they built it for. And I, I kind of show it off at work every day to to the people I work with just to... To show how sucky your life is. Hey, look <laughs> at me, I'm a sucker. <laughs> just to convince myself I didn't make a mistake. But the performance seems to go down every day. <laughs> so oh, I'm not no. sure what's happening. I don't know if they're, it's my They're laptop. shutting down the servers. They see the yeah. numbers they're getting. They're trying to save on money. But uh, what was the question? Just my general thoughts on Stadia? Yeah, let's talk about like how did launch go? Any issues? Any successes? Uh, launch went bad. The founders didn't get their codes for half a week. And oh, that so was the whole, whole kind of thing of buying the founders thing. So you can quote unquote claim your name and all that stuff. So I didn't get Tristan at Stadia.com or whatever their, their systems are. Uh, the controllers were also late. Mine came in like four days afterwards. And Didn't you live like 20 minutes away from Google. Yes. <laughs> I, I live in San Francisco downtown and Google is in Mountain View. So Uh-oh. I'm not sure what happened there. And honestly, cross save for Destiny 2 was probably the easiest and, and delightful thing, but that's more Bungie's credit rather than Google. Yeah. yeah. And the gaming experience just has been subpar. I've heard, we, like, every selling point for this game pretty much flip, flipped on its head. Yeah, the they game like, states aren't there. You can't play on your iPhone. You can only play on a couple phones that they support. 4K, I, I've been playing on my MacBook Pro. Doesn't seem to work. Um, yeah, they were like, Red Dead played in 4K. And they're like, or like, everyone's like, I want to play Red Dead in 4K, right? Because they're like, my machine can't handle that right now. And then Stadia's just like, ha, well, guess what? Neither can we. So you're, you're playing at 1080p. <laughs> Honestly, playing Destiny 2 on my computer is a better experience than playing it on Stadia. Uh, Graphics-wise, latency-wise, playing with your friends-wise, because, you know, you don't connect to Steam. Um, you have to add mm. everyone on Stadia. But if your friends don't have Stadia, you can't do that. It's a, it's a big mess. You get all the games with Stadia, right? You don't have to buy them separately. Oh, you do have to buy them separately. Oh, no. Yeah, so oh, I... Oh, no. You get Destiny 2 for free, because it's free on all platforms right now. But out of the 22 games that they launched, there's only two free games right now. Destiny 2 and something called... Uh, what was it called? Samurai Showdown. Oh, oh, yeah. That was at EVO. Otherwise, you can spend... $60 on Grid, which is like a six-year-old game. Or you can buy Final Fantasy XV for 30 bucks. Mm-hmm. When can I play Fortnite on Stadia? You know what? I, I don't know. People at work were like, hey, Tristan, uh, is FIFA on there? I might be inclined to pick this up. And I looked through the game list. They have NBA, but not FIFA. So I don't, I don't hmm. know how they came up with this launch list. I would, I would assume sports games probably play all right. Uh, yeah. I saw one thing where someone said they were playing, I think it was uh, uh, Bloodworth from Easy Allies. He tweeted mm-hmm. that he got to one part in the game where there's a diverging path, and every time he chose the second path, the game crashed. Oh, God. So he's like, well, looks like I'm just going this other path. So I, I feel like any game that requires like quick movement, and reactions like Thumper, Red Dead, probably Metro, Trials Rising, Rage 2, like half the games on their launch let, list are like unplayable. Let, let's just talk about that launch list. Like where where did they like it's all like two plus year old games. They got Just Dance 2020. <laughs> that you have to buy at like full price. Like Why? I feel like as soon as Doom Eternal got delayed, like Bethesda didn't tell Stadia that, mm-hmm. and they were just like, "We just lost our ace in the hole." 
I mean, Doom oh. Eternal wouldn't have been out anyways, right? On um, launch. Because it, like, Doom Eternal's out in, what, February? Yeah, 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 yeah. But, like, it was supposed to launch originally this month, remember? Oh, I see. But they delayed right, it. Right, right, so right, it's right. like Stadia just lost, like, their huge new game that's, like, supposed to sell this thing. Like, hey, play this game on Mac settings, on Stadia. And, Alex, did you play it at PAX Stadia? Yeah, I did. Mm-hmm. I- I'm going to say right now that that demo was, like, from what I've heard with some of the latency issues, that was not a realistic yeah that was not a true, a true gaming environment that was there a, was uh, zero lag at pax like yeah, it was the, perfect there was some uh stage theatrics going on <laughs> i mean they tried to make it seem like it wasn't staged right because it was like oh you're playing on a monitor connected to a chromebook and there's no way this chromebook could be powering this game the but chromebook like, has like an xbox internal <laughs> Yeah, or but it's like, hey, but the Stadia server is like five feet away from the box, which is, you yeah. know, not what you're going to be having at your house. Or outside, like, I, their whole marketing was like, you can play on your phone. Yeah, you just play it anywhere. But, Good luck streaming 20 yeah. gigs an hour of yeah. data to your phone. There, go, there goes your data cap in one hour <laughs> on unlimited data, too. Sorry, what were you saying, Alex? Uh, yeah, it was just... It's kind of weird to me that one of their big selling points was the lack of latency that you'd experience playing this. And they chose a lot of games where, as you said, you would expect uh, you need the low latency to be able to play them well. And of course, it turns out in reality, it's got the same latency every streaming service seems to have. I don't know if it feels any better than other streaming services. I've never tried them, but yeah, it just seems like a wasted sales point to... uh, just basically lie to you like that. Yeah, I I would say that this is, you know, there was an article that came out that said game developers were worried that uh, Google would just drop Stadia, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I I can see those concerns after this launch. Like, this thing's gonna be dead very quickly. I feel like if Google doesn't do something in the next three to four months, yeah, they're gonna pull like an artifact and just uh release a blog post saying somewhere down the line we'll fix it taking a step back what is yep. the, that's what they said right <laughs> i think yep. so that was yep. basically the gist yep. of it yeah yep i i this is the weird thing that i think about this is that like they, they gotta make it like a netflix right you can't have it where you have to buy every game but here's the thing publishers aren't going to go for that so they're in this weird sticky spot where i like, honestly think making it free is like the the, the platform sorry, itself making the platform free to start or whatever they're calling it sorry that's a nintendo term mm-hmm. was probably the worst mistake because if you make it free you have to like you need to be able to pay your developer something so they have to make the games full price and now they're stuck in this weird hole of i don't want to buy a game i don't want to rebuy all my games on stadia and not be able to play with my friends and not have my save save files and Google is not going to be able to basically port over the majority of gamers. And they're not going to entice the casual gamers because, like, my mom doesn't want to play Red Dead Redemption 2, right? That's too bad. Mom yeah, and Jones is missing out. It's, it's a big shame, yeah. to be honest. So, you know, they're, they're, I feel like that's where they made the big mistake. I think I forget on Live's uh, kind of financial model. I think you bought the games. Did you buy the games? Or here, uh, GeForce. GeForce Now, they're in beta. But basically, you log into all your accounts. So you basically keep all the games you have. Right, okay, yeah. So I feel like this is a weird middle ground that doesn't make sense for anyone at the moment. Yeah, it it feels like it's not playing in the same pool as everybody else. It's just kind of there. Oh, on live was you rented a game for a certain amount of time. I see. Yeah. Which, you know, actually kind of makes more sense. Ish, right? Mm-hmm. Um, here's, here's something I thought about right now, right? If we were in some wacky world where the situation was reversed, where we had to cloud game with input lag and like weird glitches and stuff like this, and I said, hey, Tristan, they're coming out with this new thing. It's called a game console. <laughs> It's where you have the box, you pay three hundred dollars, right? Oh my god! And we give you the box, and all that uh-huh. goes away. Mm-hmm. We would all buy that box. We would. 
Yeah, it's the magic black box. But if you flip the scenario around, everyone's like, no. Like, why? Why would I want input lag? Why would I want these weird, like, timeouts and disconnects? No, no, but, but the, but the kind of argument there would be, oh man, why would I have to go home to play my video game? Right? Yeah, don't you have phones? Does it even work on your phone though? In that, in that ideal state, it should. Mm -hmm. That's true. But you know, we're talking about if, if Stadia actually launched in an ideal state and the answer to that question is no. Absolutely not. I, you know what? Like, if Google can't do it, I don't know who can. I, no, no, no. That's not the right phrase. I think Google couldn't do it because they don't know video games. I don't yeah. know how Microsoft will do it, but I'm pretty sure it'll be much better than this. I think I agree, actually, with that. I think mm-hmm. Microsoft... I mean, see, the one thing, right, is just the latency, right? Yeah, yeah you always, can't make latency go yeah. away. And that's here's the problem. The here's the problem, though. right? Ninten- like, not say Nintendo. Microsoft, Google, Sony, they can only handle so much. And by that, I mean, with the internet, it all depends on how good is the end consumer's internet, right? Mm-hmm. They can only handle so much. And obviously, if someone's like, my internet sucks, uh, this Xbox game streaming service sucks, it's like, n- Microsoft's like, well, I mean, there's two to blame for that one. But, yeah, I don't know. This I think is a... I think the world state of internet and access of human beings is not at a level where this will work. Yeah, at, unless at you're like South Korea, like you're South Korea, you're good to go. I mean, you're mm-hmm. South, Korea, you're in South Korea, and the servers are also in South Korea. I think right, that's yeah, the only exactly. way it works. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Alrighty. Any last Stadia thoughts before we? Probably never talk about this again, except for what the I... article that it comes out that Stadia shutting down. What do I what do I do with my controller? <laughs> uh, what you know you I have some people that you can talk to. Oh. It's uh everyone that bought an Ouya. You can talk oh. to them for what they did with their console. I, at least the Ouya had some good games. It had Towerfall. Yeah, and the mobile version of uh, San Andreas. It didn't. It, I think all it had was mobile games. It did. Yeah. All right. All right. Poor Stadia. But that wraps it up for episode 40. Four, four times 10, guys. It's a, it's a big number. We're getting we're getting mm-hmm. to 50. It's getting real Ooh. close. Uh-oh. We're about to... I think 50 is, two, 50 is the two-year mark. I think it is. Alrighty. Well, that wraps it up for episode 40 of Viewport Relay. Viewport Relay is available on Radio Public, iTunes, Google Music, Stitcher, Podbean, and all your favorite podcast directories. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to subscribe, review, and share it with your friends. We're also on social media as Viewport Gaming on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. But Alex, why Viewport Gaming? Well, Viewport Gaming is a website for video game reviews, features, and uh, this very podcast you're listening to. So you can check out our older episodes of Viewport Relay, and also on uh, the site at viewportgaming.com. Thanks, Alex. As always, I've been your host, Albert Corson, joined by Tristan John. Goodbye. And Alex Nestor. See you next time.